I will briefly begins, describe. It begins with a lecture, quite like this one. An older man is talking about the labyrinth and how it wraps itself around us. It is a journey, a quest, a game that we play. It's the narrow streets of a market in the old part of town, the veins and arteries that run through our bodies. It's the wires and waves of communication. It's the drama of Theseus the hero and of Ariadne. The labyrinth that Daedalus built for Minos to house the Minotaur is not merely the scenery to this drama. It is the drama. The characters that inhabit this story are archetypes, representations of our unconscious brought into the light so that we may know ourselves. And when we look for heroes in our modern world, we must seek new models but retain the architecture of the hero's solitary journey so that anyone undertaking that journey becomes heroic. And that architecture is still that of the labyrinth. The Cretan model was not the only one in antiquity. The ancient Greek historian Herodotus described an Egyptian labyrinth that he considered more fascinating than the pyramids. It had 12 covered courts, six in a row facing north, six south the gates of one range exactly fronting the gates of the other, with a continuous wall around the outside of the hole. Inside, the building is of two stories and contains 3,000 rooms, of which half are underground and the other half directly above them. Herodotus was allowed to visit only the upper rooms, those below being reserved for the tombs of the kings who built the labyrinth, and also the tombs of the sacred crocodiles. Today, is not any city a labyrinth for those who visit, or any government building? The underground transportation system, or the modern suburban marketplace, which is often a city in itself, is not the person who dares navigate any of these labyrinthine environments, either a confident hero, or, perhaps more often, a lost victim condemned to wander aimlessly. Often the victim seeks refuge in brief visits to the countryside. But even in the country, plowed fields and untamed growth present obstacles to access and challenges for the uninitiated. Forests are a place where indecision leads to danger and where a victim thrown into its darkness may become hopelessly lost and may begin to find the darkness within himself. Long ago, I was given a text that described the labyrinth, or some labyrinth, and in 2004, I set out to discover what might lie within its dark passages. I was not unprepared for this task, as I'd already spent a number of years creating scenography for theater and events in unusual places, often in the countryside and the forest. In fact, my first theater experience was the creation of set pieces and costumes for a music drama performed on and around a lake at dawn. This piece, the Princess of the Stars, began a 30-year association with Canadian composer Armory Schaefer, during which time my wife, costume designer Diana Smith, and I have designed all of Schaefer's 12-part series of music dramas, known as the Patria Cycle. briefly describe a few of these works in order to provide context for the current research. Ra, the story of the sun god of ancient Egypt, who dies each night and is reborn every morning, was presented as an all-night performance at the Ontario Science Centre and in a variety of spaces throughout the city of Leiden in Holland. It was an intense experience and a test of endurance for a limited audience. Up. 
The greatest show was a labyrinth of another kind, a fairground of alleyways and dark passages in which chaos is released. Each audience member here was able to create their own journey and so develop their own unique narrative, although the themes were reinforced by having the entire audience start together at the beginning and return for a finale. Too long without heroes and sick from desire. We've made her whole again! Bring them back! It's all gone wrong! Get out! The alchemical theater of Hermes Trismegistos took us on a journey of alchemical transformation. So you can see that many of Schaeffer's music dramas revolve around themes of transformation, rebirth, order, and chaos. And the unifying image or architecture is the labyrinth. Three productions of operatic theater were presented in the Halliburton Forest near Algonquin Park, for which we had to cut our way through the forest with machetes and GPS devices to literally carve our theater out of the woods. These outdoor works, while not created in response to the site, were definitely designed to take advantage of the possibilities and minimize the difficulties of the location. Audience sight lines, of course, but also the terrain over which our audience had to travel, the sounds of the forest, insects, weather, sunsets, and an occasional aurora borealis were elements that we had to concern ourselves with or, in some cases, marvel at as serendipitous additions to a performance. In one case, we were treated to a total eclipse of the moon on opening. As theater artists are questioning more than ever the limitations of traditional theater space and taking their practice to found environments, and while there has been documentation around urban and historical approaches to site-specific practice, little has been written about theater and the natural environment, of the rural or wilderness landscape where my practice takes place. So it was these varied experiences in dealing with the relationship between scenography and the natural environment that prompted me to undertake this research creation project based on Schaefer's outline of the labyrinth. The project is designed to explore, among other things, scenographic text and how design shapes narrative. Theatricalized spatial configurations, proxemic distances, and haptic surfaces as components of storytelling. 
loci of transition, doors and portals, thresholds and passageways that the audience member will cross as part of a theatrical journey. The question of self and other and the transformation of spectator to performer, addressed in part through the notion of reflection. I knew the story of the impetuous Theseus and his desire to be the hero and slay the monster that lies at the heart of the labyrinth, of Ariadne, whose song was the thread, the lifeline for anyone trying to navigate their way back out of the darkness, and of the Minotaur, the half-man, half-bull creature, resulting from the union of the Moon Queen Pacify and the White Bull of Poseidon. I had visited Knossos on Crete, and I had read the text of Asterion. Here was myth and magic, conflict and struggle. Here was the stuff of legend and of storytelling. Already I imagined a complex series of pathways, twists and turns, dark tunnels, but in reality there was only an open field, surrounded by cedar woods. I decided to gather a small group and return to begin exploring this terrain and the story it might tell. And so began a journey. We started by covering our eyes with blindfolds and walking to see where we would end up. When we stopped and opened our eyes, we had traveled as far away from each other as we could get, and I knew this was to be a journey each one would face alone. As each of us walks a path, the experience is unique, and we create our own story. Asterion is conceived as a theatrical experience for one person at a time. That person is the audience, spectator, participant. We have not come up with an appropriate designation for the person who takes on the journey. Schaefer calls that person the neophyte. I set out to make a path, and as you follow it, you make the story. The story is told through sound and image, through touch and texture. Are we making theater? When you leave the seats of a theatre building and become an ambulatory audience member moving through theatricalized spaces, you become aware of the power of areas of transition. Simply passing through a doorway or turning a corner provides a potential for the kind of theatricality of experience that I'm seeking. The door or portal is a profound metaphor. In practice, the locus of transition sets up expectations, and if opening one door elicits an emotional response, then it is easy to establish a pattern of anticipation. At times, we are in control of the direction we take, but often a turning of the path or the opening of a door leads to an opportunity or obstacle we could not anticipate. I'm speaking here not just about the journey the neophyte might take through the labyrinth, but also the journey we are taking in the process. Isn't life interesting? It's kind of like theater, and perhaps we should delve further into the differences between a linear narrative that unfolds as you watch from a single vantage, and a linear journey that allows one to become the narrative. Simply by moving through space, we are making choices. By engaging with the physicality of the space I have created for you, and especially its surface and outward appearance, we are communicating, you and I. By devising the spatial configuration, I am also a performer in this game. However, the immersive nature of the experience does not demand that the neophyte necessarily be aware of the relationship between the artist and the space that's been created. Seven is magic. Squared, it is 49. There are four introductory sections, of which this lecture is one. The remaining 45 sections consist of nine encounters, eight trials, seven experiences, six contemplations, five revelations, four arcana, a trio of deceptions, a duet of lovers, and a finale. Will the neophyte navigating the labyrinth realize that there is a descending series of events as she hurtles toward the finale? Ah, the notion of awareness and realization. And will the traveler understand her role as performer of the labyrinth? 
Can the participating spectator be trained to understand this role? Will they be aware of the path they carve through the passageways? The labyrinth is to be experienced by one person at a time. As we move through it, we find that sometimes the light is bright, and as we look out through a pair of windows, we see many wonderful things. At other times, we open our eyes in darkness and are frightened. When we look behind us, the black and white fold into gray and our steps are half lost in the mists. As we walk, we stir up dust. It's the dust of history, the dust of our imaginations and dreams, the dust of words we've read that won't be left behind and that follow us in a whirlpool around our knees. These many dusts swirl before our eyes, coloring and filtering all we see. They collect around our ears and try to whisper that we've been here before. The dust fills our nostrils, and smell memory excites our brains and carries us into some past experience. And all these we drag along with us, and everything we see and hear and feel and smell, everything we taste and touch, and that touches us, becomes a part of our journey, shaping and reshaping our surroundings by the images we project on the walls and ground until we're no longer sure if what we perceive is real. And of course, it is not outside the confines of our journey, because as each of us creates our path, it becomes unique. The story that unfolds as we carve our way from room to room becomes our story and is embellished and ornamented with the dusts of our very selves. This we bring to the journey through the labyrinth. When does the journey begin? Perhaps it has begun already. There is no great door to open marking the entrance, no curtain to rise revealing the setting, no opening credits, teasers, or trailers. Did you really attend a lecture that spoke of the labyrinth of our lives, our past, our bodies? And did you find an application form upon leaving the lecture room? Did you then request that you be allowed to visit the labyrinth, to undertake this journey? Did you agree to meet at a specified crossroads, and were you then driven blindfolded in daylight darkness to an unknown location, sent down this path, walking alone between tall grasses, towering thorns, and humming insects? When we attend the theater, our experience begins well before the lights dim. Here, by the time we round a corner and see the gaping jaws of a wolf ready to swallow us, we are already committed to the journey. The wolf is Theseus. The open jaws lie between berms that are the legs of Mother Earth and invite us to penetrate the toothed darkness. We are now on the path, but the we has become you. The journey has begun and you are traveling alone. It begins with encounters. In a curving pathway through arches of bent cedar, you sense a presence behind you, and you turn to discover an apparition with the wizened head of an ancient jackal, the guardian of the Egyptian dead, who offers you safe passage, but warns that now there is no turning back. Words spoken in darkness allow you to create pictures in your mind. Words spoken in half-light cause you to peer into the gloom to find meaning. And as you wind through darkness, mummified remains and images of creatures extinct or near extinction invite you to join them. Ancient Egypt conjures associations of death and rebirth. Egypt becomes ancient Crete and you are facing a portal. Opening it, you find yourself in a small room, the sloping walls of which are covered with intricate glyphs. In the room is Thetis, who will translate the lines on the walls into words that tell of Theseus, Ariadne, 
and the Minotaur. And what of the Minotaur, the monster that inhabits the darkest corner of the labyrinth? If the labyrinth is a reflection of ourselves that we create as we move through it, then the Minotaur is the dark creature within ourselves that we must confront as part of the journey we undertake. From wrath arises infatuation, from infatuation loss of memory, from loss of memory loss of mind, then you will perish. But when your mind is disciplined, you move among the objects of sense, with the senses free of attachment. Sorrows melt into clear peace. You remain illuminated. Each room, each pathway, turn, portal, or event contributes to the story. You encounter Shadow, who reminds you that you and your Shadow are one and the same. You meet a group that have begun the journey and have been seduced by the exotic distractions they found and urge you to join them, but you are disturbed by the deformities which were the price of their admission to this particular sideshow, so you carry on. Icarus, the rambunctious child, has stolen a pair of wings and is trying to escape. There's a pair for you. Will you try? Or will you continue to the workshop of the labyrinth's architect, Daedalus? where machines and gears seem to be operating perpetually in an attempt to keep the labyrinth visible to the traveler. Daedalus convinces you that you are on the right track and sends you to the dome and Phaedra, who suggests that perhaps you're not. Theseus rushes past you, almost knocking you over and disappears down the dark corridor. Light and dark is a recurring theme in Asterion and the transitions from lightness into darkness and back to light inform the way the narrative develops. The dense cedar woods and surrounding field of Asterion provide a suitable locus for this phenomenon to play out. From the beginning we have been creating pathways through the border which separates dark from light, inner from outer. When we began we simply let the forest tell us where the path should be. As we became more familiar with the process, we were able to negotiate with the forest, and by working together, we created patterns. We started with the classic labyrinth pattern, such as the one found in Chartres Cathedral, and often duplicated. It's constructed as follows, a cross with a point and connected by curved lines, creating a unicursal path that folds back on itself as we move toward the center. The middle image is the same basic model, but with an added layer of complexity. In both cases, we must then retrace our steps to return to the entrance. However, I have found that the linear narrative of ambulatory theatre is disrupted when the route is not continuous, so I've tried to avoid having the neophyte return on the same path at any point in the journey. By adjusting the geometry of the plan, as shown in the lower image, we have an exit built in. The cedar forest provides a fascinating environment. We have created paths by cutting small trees and then weaving the cut stems through the trees at the sides of the path as railings. As we look through the forest, the play of horizontal lines against vertical provides a sense that there is an infinity of passageways that you may or may not be able to access. Asterion is an attempt to blur the boundaries between action and the environment that supports or in fact shapes the action. The solitary participant in this dramatic quest is required to develop his or her own narrative by interacting with the surrounding space and the occasional live performer. Sonography should now, by now be able to address time, space, performance and narrative on a number of levels by providing an immersive journey for an ambulatory spectator that might utilize any of these parameters in a multitude of combinations. Time is malleable. It can be stretched or contracted, be at the front of our awareness and of great import, or forgotten and of no consequence. Two identical rooms, by the nature of the scenographic intervention applied to them, can cause the person crossing that space to perceive the passage of time quite differently. 
This has narrative implications as well as practical. I'm noting here that there is no third party to observe the interaction of performer and space, and in fact the spectator role will in time have transmuted to that of performer by the process of actively engaging with the environment. So by not conforming to Peter Brook's definition of what makes theatre, and by not trying to broaden the world of performance unnecessarily, I'm leaving the question of what Asterion is open for the time being. By combining time and space, and having the participant negotiate the space in their own time, there will be a confusion of role expectations, of which the participant may or may not be aware, and this is probably just fine. So if the one moving through the space is both performer and audience, it must be the space that creates the tension that will drive this narrative and keep the person motivated to continue. Now in doing that, there are options in how the narrative bits and pieces are presented, and we should aim to attain a balance of helping and hindering that will provide an appropriate mix of comfort and apprehension. We do at times wish to disorient the participants to help them shed the need for control and of knowing where they are in relation to the world they have left, and so to increase the anticipation of the next encounter. Most of the rooms in the events of the labyrinth are unpopulated. The story is told by the walls, the textures, the sounds, and the scents. But from time to time the traveler comes face to face with a performer, costumed, sometimes masked. These encounters must allow for an engagement between actor and participant that is immediate and visceral. The actor steers the neophyte and controls the pace of the journey through that section. The one-on-one -on -one nature of the performance can move back and forth between presentation and conversation as the participating audience member starts to take on a performative role. There is craft involved as well, the craft that entails making things out of available resources. Part of the development process of Asterion has been the creation of shelters and interior spaces, as well as pathways. Early on we built walls with cedars cut from the forest, rope and cloth. Local farms with straw encouraged us to consider straw bale construction. A donation of cement, sand and gravel allowed us to explore ferro-cement for building and sculpture. We had the use of a backhoe front-end loader, and so incorporated earthworks into the process. Our funding meant that we could hire a number of students that allowed for labor-intensive strategies to be feasible. In 2006, we had a crew of 20 students and constructed a straw maze and a 20-foot dome. Through all this building and exploring, painting and singing, we have indeed been seeking information about the relationship between the scenographic environment and the participating audience member in the context of site-specific theater. We've been addressing scenographic text, and how design shapes narrative. Theatricalized spatial configurations, proxemic distances, and haptic surfaces as components of storytelling. Loci of transition, doors and portals, thresholds and passageways that the audience member will cross as part of a theatrical journey. And the question of self and other, and the transformation of spectator to performer, addressed in part through the notion of reflection. And if you should come visit the labyrinth, in the process, I want to know you. I want to understand what makes you tick, what makes you laugh, what makes you cry out in fear. I want you to crawl on the ground with your fingers deep in the moist soil. I want you to smell the earth, and I want you to listen so carefully you can hear the stones speaking to you. At the end, when your hands and face are washed in cool, scented water, and the songs of illumination have washed over you. I want you to walk out into the sunshine, alone, and feel that the grasses beneath you, the breeze, the sky, the birds, and you have all made a wonderful journey together and have been transformed.